this biochar because I think it's a really interesting context. And I see that um, in the United States, biochar is really focused so far on the evolution of research and commercial companies making its way up to you know, the USDA and national policy. And in the United States, remineralization is simply, at this point, pretty much a grassroots movement. But in Brazil, it is the emerging, it's an emerging national policy with a top-down top approach through research and policy making. There is legislation right now before uh, Congress, which will be signed by Dilma Rousseff, uh, for a remineralization program with a social justice aspect. So they hope to create distribution hubs uh, throughout Brazil for small and family farmers with rock dust, which the farmers call independence fertilizer because it makes them independent from chemical fertilizers and pesticides. And uh, so they've done millions of dollars of research in BRAPA, which is their version of the USDA, is leading the research program. And uh, so now they're legislating regulation of the commercial companies coming up with the criteria. So it's a really different approach, but I wanted just to place that context because we'll also be very interested in integrating biochar and remineralization into, into research and policy there. So, thank you. And our second speaker will be Preet Tamarang, or Tamarang from University of Finland, a PhD student. And he's studying the effects of biochar use as a soil amendment on soil fertility, plant properties on boreal soils. And he's also the general chair of the Nordic Biochar Seminar in the past. Our last speaker is Kirk Jones. He's an ecological engineer at Whole Farm Services in Vermont. And he's focused on utilizing biochar for waste water treatment and also interested in the overall protection of our water resources. So without further ado, I have Dr. Garo here, president of Global Coral Reef Alliance. <clears throat> Thank you. It's a pleasure to be here. Um, let's see, so how do I get this in a presentation mode here? Uh, excuse me? Press this one? I just want to get it in a presentation sure. mode. Yeah. Um, yeah, I've been fascinated by biochar for more than 30 years. I set up the first lab in Brazil to measure greenhouse gases with high precision and did that in order to compare the greenhouse gas emissions to the atmosphere from undisturbed forests in the Amazon versus anthropologically um, modified areas. And um, I knew about biochar then, and I've been wanting to work at it ever since, but it took me about 30 years to get a chance to do so, unfortunately. Um, now, what we have done here is we are looking at the interactions of rock powder. Oops, sorry, this is, how, how do I do this here? Oh, I see, back, back, back. Okay, so we are looking at the interactions here of rock powders with biochar because we believe these are ideal complements for increasing soil fertility with natural, slow-release, long-lasting fertilizer materials to replace chemical fertilizers and, uh, and pesticides. Um, we began first by looking at the effect of basalt powders in Panama and I worked in some of the poorest soils in Panama, and what I did there, this is without biochar, I'll go run through this very quickly, we looked at acacia mangium that was planted in the poorest soils in Panama, and we had sites that had rock basalt dust and nothing else added to it. We didn't have biochar available, no compost, nothing else. And we measured the heights of whole populations of trees over a five-year period um, in poor soils, transition soils where they had basalt below the surface, and then trees growing directly in basalt powder. There was a waste product of a quarry that was a grinding basalt for, for gravel and for which the powder was a waste product. So we looked at the trees growing in these different habitats. <clears throat> and over a five-year period, as you can see here, the green is the ones growing in basalt powder, the blue is in the transition zone, and the red is in the local soil. So the trees growing in the basalt powder grew much faster. Whoops and they had much higher survival. The ones that were growing slowly mostly died in the local soils. It was extremely infertile. Um, <clears throat> when we measured the tree heights over these populations after five years, these are uh, 
basalt powder on the left and local soils on the right, you can see there's a big difference in height. When we take the calibration of biomass versus tree height for the same species in similar soils, it turns out that we were getting, whoops, there's a typo on that, we were getting about eight times faster growth rate of biomass in the trees on basalt without any biochar or, or fertilizer or nitrogen or anything else being added, nothing more than the ground basalt dust. Um, <clears throat> And we then take, took a look at the chemistry of the soil and we found that the basalt powder compared to the local soils was greatly enriched in phosphorus, iron, zinc, manganese, potassium, magnesium, calcium, somewhat enriched in organic matter but not nearly as much and that's interesting because the, the greater fertility of the soil only led to a fairly small increase in the organic carbon in the soil, about it's nearly a 50% nearly a increase. Um, and there are small differences in copper, pH, and uh, aluminum. So, those, those are, so we, we figure that the rock powder is, is providing the minerals that are missing from these highly weathered leached tropical soils and uh, that are deficient in calcium and potassium and magnesium and a lot of other things as well as nitrogen and phosphorus. The basalt powder provides essentially all the missing elements except nitrogen. But the tree we were growing was a nitrogen fixer. But there's no doubt that we would have gotten much better results with biochar if we'd had it. So the rock powders alone greatly stimulated the growth of the trees. Obviously, the worse the soil, the greater the stimulation would be. And these were extremely poor soils. They provide a wide range of essential minerals that all plants need that are not present in many chemical fertilizers. The weathering of the rocks is a CO2 sink because CO2, which is an acid dissolved in the rainwater, then reacts with the minerals to release the calcium and potassium and so forth. It gets converted into bicarbonate, which then flushes out to the sea. So that is a CO2 sink. The weathering reaction itself is a CO2 sink. And we figured that had we had biochar, we would have been able to do very much better. So our feeling was that rock powders alone are very voluble. Uh, they do serve as a CO2 sink. But we need to optimize them by combining them with biochar because biochar essentially is a carrier for fertilizer in a water rather than a fertilizer per se. You need to add the missing elements and the rock powder is an ideal source of all of that except for nitrogen. So one needs a compost in addition to that. So what we decided to do following that initial experiment is we did a, a preliminary experiment at a place called New Harmony Farm which is an organic farm in West Newbury, Massachusetts about an hour or so from here. And we used plots, 32 plots, I'll show you the arrangement in a minute, but we laid out different amounts of biochar and of basalt rock powder in them to try to look at the interactions between the two. Um, the biochar came from Bob Wells of New England Bio, Biochar. It was one year old pine and oak wood uh, that he had mixed with leaf compost, again pine and oak, a year before and had it somewhat maturing. Um, he also gave me some raw stuff and he warned me not to use that because it was uh, too strong. Um, and then we also used basalt powder that was provided by Tom Vanacor of Rock Dust Local, which is the only company in the U.S. that actually sources local sources of rock powders for use in agriculture. Obviously, rock types vary a great deal and this is a basalt that comes from near here, from Holyoke, from right, right near the Amherst area. And it's, regarded as about the best rock powder in New England for agricultural purposes because of the broad distribution of elements and the relatively appropriate ratios. So uh, this is our site here and I've marked in the white square here, there's a, a barn here and this, this is our site. This is the Merrimack River down here um, and um, this used to be actually the riverbed of the Merrimack River, this farm. Um, and there's an interesting history to the site um, this is the first map made of Massachusetts in 1634 in William Wood's book, and our farm site is right here. This is the old river channel, and this is where the farm is. This map was published in 1634. 1635 was the greatest hurricane that ever hit New England, <laughs> the great colonial uh, hurricane, sorry, and that, the water flowed through here and jammed this channel full. And so our farm is right on that filled-in channel on the south side there. <coughs> um, now, it's an interesting time because, well, here is here's sort of a perspective view, and this is our site right here in what used to be the old riverbed. Now, it's only a few inches above the river water, so it's a pretty low-lying site, and that, that poses special problems, as I'll come to a little later. Uh, but anyway, it's a, it's a very interesting site. 
Um, now, the Merrimack River drains almost all of New Hampshire. In 1635, however, there was no agriculture, there was no deforestation in land in Massachusetts. The whole foreign population in, in New England lived on the shore in Massachusetts and Rhode Island. They were devastated by the hurricane, but they were all along the shore, and the interior was entirely in forest. Okay, now, of course, that's all been deforced and all that good soil washed away beginning in the 1700s and 1800s. They're all pretty much washed away. But we, we were, you know, the soil that we have at our site is probably pretty much free of anthropogenic influences, what it had eroded at the time when there was still natural soil formation processes taking place. Um, and later, the richest soil all washed away, but we don't have that. Um, well, that's another aerial view. Um, so we laid out sites, and what we did is we have, um, in this row here, we have zero basalt and one unit of basalt in each plot, two and three. And then here we have no biochar, no biochar, we've got doubles, replicates, one unit of biochar, two units of biochar, and then another set of controls with no biochar. And so what we're trying to do is to see if these things interact. Now, we recognize this is a long-term project because both biochar and rock powder take several years to come to mature impact. The weathering of the minerals depends on the grain size. The biochar has to absorb the missing nutrients. We're, we're starting with raw biochar that essentially didn't have any minerals in it. And so that means it has a very high carbon to nitrogen ratio. And of course, with very high carbon to nitrogen ratio, I'll we'll come to that in a minute, that tends to steal nitrogen from your plants. The very first crop we put in with beets and radishes what we found was, this is as a function of basalt powder, zero, one, two, and three units. What we found is that the radishes grew 2.25 times faster with higher rock dust, and the beets grew 2.5 times faster. So that's an increase of 150% and 125%. And this is the weight per plant at crop time. Um, and then there's some evidence of excess fertilization here because then it comes back down. So we seem to have an optimal volume here with that concentration of rock powders. So that, that stimulated right away in the very first crop. The biochar, on the other hand, had an inhibitory effect. And this was pretty raw biochar. It didn't affect the radishes very much, but the beets with high biochar grew only about half as fast as they did without it. And I think what's happening is simply the high carbon to nitrogen ratio of the biochar is out competing the plant for nitrogen. Once the biochar matures, that effect will reverse. But it, it does, it's an important point because a lot of people are using raw biochar and expecting miracle results and not getting it because they're not dealing with mature biochar. And I think, you know, obviously people who are professionals in the biochar business understand this distinction, but a lot of people don't. So I think we'll let's finish and we can take questions at the end. By volume or weight? Sorry? Percentages by weight, I would imagine your units in the biochar concentration. The units, yeah, these units are buckets. Uh, by, by <laughs> buckets, uh, so there's a unit amount, yes. And I, I did weigh the buckets, but I, I've got to calculate out the weight per unit area and all that. But there's one standard bucket load. <laughs> um, yeah, so anyway, this is the very first crop. Now our goal, oops, sorry, our goal is to do this long term. And unfortunately, we began this experiment late last year and um, the second crop that we put in last year went in so late that the frost caught it, so we didn't get good data for a second crop. The third crop, which is this year's crop, the second year, is in the ground now. And unfortunately, this year they had a very late start. The site flooded, they were unable to, to plow the soil, and they were unable to work the soil or plant it until something around July. So we, we've got three different kinds of beets in the ground right now, and they're not ready to harvest. So I don't have any results from the second year. Um, so all I have, these are very preliminary results. These are the very first crop, and we don't think they're going to be representative of the long-term results. So we do want to follow that and see the changes with time. But um, our goal is, as I say, to continue this experiment for some years. Now, the owner of this farm has got another farm that's in a drier location. We plan to set up some new experiments and use a wider range of materials. But our goal here is not to add anything more, not to add nitrogen, not to add compost or anything, but just try to follow this for several years. Um, oops, sorry. Um, was there a question there? No. Uh, yes. Okay. Um, so an interesting feature that we saw right away in terms of biological activity is that the basalt powder greatly stimulated earthworm activity. I came back to the point after we harvested the first crop 
And we had a situation where it had been raining heavily, the ground was very wet and dark, but we'd had a couple dry periods. And that meant all the earthworm castings were sitting on the surface and they were looking bright and light colored because they dried out against the dark soil on the background. So it was very easy to run around and count them. And this is, of course, what Charles Darwin did in his last book on the formation of vegetable mold by the action of earthworms, is counted earthworm droppings. So I was very pleased to follow Charles Darwin and get down on my knees and count earthworm droppings. And it's a very interesting pattern. The control plots had very few earthworm castings. The biochar increased it a fair bit, but the basalt powder had a huge increase in earthworm castings. So that, that seemed to be answering some sort of nutritional need for the earthworms. Again, it'll be interesting to see if this changes with time. But for sure, we're getting a lot more biological activity in our soils as a result of adding these things. These are greenhouse gas emissions, CO2, nitrous oxide, and nitric oxide. And this was done by Jim Tang and Rebecca Riles at the Woods Hole Marine Biological Laboratory Ecosystem Center. And this is very preliminary, but basically what we found is there seems to be lower CO2 emissions in the basalt and the high char sites. With N2O, it's a bit mixed. The high basalt had less N2O emission, but the high char seemed to have more. And then um, nitric oxide was absorbed out of the atmosphere in all of these things, and it was absorbed highest in the control. So one of our interests here is to follow these sites through time and to see how greenhouse gas emissions change, because obviously our goal is to produce soil that's more fertile, food crops that are more nutritious, and have less greenhouse gas emissions. Obviously, we'd like to document as well carbon storage in the soil, both as elemental carbon or biochar and as organic carbon. We've taken soil samples, but we haven't had time to do that yet. This whole project has been run with no funding, so that's a bit of a problem. Um, and it's a long-term experiment because we think these benefits will take several years to mature. And, um, but the gist of it is, is that we feel that rock powders are the ideal complement to biochar along with sources of nitrogen that are ideally coming from compost or sewage or other sources. Kirk Jones will talk a bit about that in, in, in the later talk. And I say our goal is a more ecologically sound and productive agriculture that removes CO2 from the atmosphere. So again, we're going to have to seek funding to continue this. One of, a lot of our efforts are focused around a book that's going to come out late next year called Geotherapy, Innovative Methods of Soil Fertility Restoration, Carbon Sequestration Reducing Atmospheric CO2. Ron Larson, can you raise your hand, Ron, is one of the co-editors. He's one of the organizers of this conference. Joanna Campy, who's a, the executive director of Remineralize the Earth, is also one of the editors. We have nearly 40 chapters of books from all over the world. A lot of People here at this, this meeting are, are authors, and David Yarrow, among others, Eric Knight, a lot of other people here. <clears throat> um, so our goal is the following. Rock powders and biochar have been dismissed by a lot of farmers and by policymakers as sort of being anecdotal. And we say people you know, have a picture, look at my big tomato, but they don't have controls and they don't have replicates. And so a lot of people dismiss this. These, these data as being merely anecdotal. They, don't, they, they want to see hard numbers. It's surprisingly hard to find them because farmers who believe in biochar or in rock powder put it on everything. They don't leave controls behind. And it's very difficult to find the comparison. So we tried to find people who had data on these things in every continent except Antarctica. So among the authors in this book are chapters from every, from all, every major inhabited continent of the world. Um, they're using different plants, different climate regimes, different soil types, and so forth. But they all show positive results. And I think the point we're trying to make with this book is to emphasize that these are very powerful techniques for agriculture. They're cost effective in most places. Uh, we have some very interesting chapters on that, particularly from Africa with rock powders. A lot cheaper than chemical fertilizers, lasts longer and gets better results. And, and our point is, is that we want this data to be available for people to realize this is a global phenomenon applicable every place, that we need to be doing, lar as a matter of policy, large-scale sort of fertility restoration using natural materials in order to sequester CO2 from the atmosphere on a worldwide scale. In fact, if we don't greatly increase soil carbon, we can't possibly stabilize CO2 at safe levels. Soil carbon is the only place we can put it safely. And there's all this nonsense about geoengineering. Ron will talk about this a little later, pie in the sky stuff. But the only place we can practically store it at a cost we can afford with immediate benefits is to put it into the soil. 
Now, I've been involved for some 30 years with the UN Framework Convention on Climate Change trying to push for soils to get recognized as a carbon sink. They still aren't. And that's something we need to push on. I got the president of Micronesia at one point in Copenhagen to call for a CO2 goal of pre-industrial CO2 and wide-scale use of biochar to absorb CO2 from the atmosphere. He was completely ignored. No other government understood what he was talking about or why. But we intend to keep that fight up because we really have to turn the UN Framework Convention on Climate Change into something that is effective and works and solves the problems because the soil is the only place we can put it in the time frame that will make a difference. It's the only place. There isn't any other choice. Um, and so we want to emphasize UN climate change negotiations. There's another issue too, and I, I'm just back last week from the United Nations Environment Program Global Conference on Land Ocean Connections, which is, is a global plan of action to reduce land-based sources of emission to aquatic environments. And of course, nitrogen and phosphorus are the key problems there because they stimulate algae blooms and severe eutrophication. And so the issue is how do you keep the nitrogen and phosphorus on the land? And they were not aware of biochar, but there are global activities and global treaties aimed at trying to reduce these kinds of emissions. And we think biochar needs to be involved in, in those environmental negotiations as well as in the climate change negotiations. Anyway, I'll stop there. Um, I think that's it. Thank you very much. Yeah, yeah. After each presentation, I would like to have the questions. Okay. So please wait until they finish their presentation, and uh, we'll yield the floor, the floor for about five minutes for questions. So please ask away. Go ahead. Um, well, I don't know where to start. Maybe we should start in the back there. If you talk loud, I don't know if there's a <laughs> way to get back. Um, I don't hear well, so you've got to talk loud. I had a question. Since that site is flooding a lot, is that going to be washing the biochar out of the soil and away from your plots? The erosion of your biochar mm -hmm. due to the, the level of the land in the, in the riverbed. Am I worried about erosion yes. of biochar? Um, well, it, it's flat. It's flat. So I don't see that as a problem. And what we did is we mixed it into the soil, both the rock powder, you know, we turned it over quite a bit. Um, and, and it, it's flat. So I don't see erosion as being a problem at that site, but obviously in other places it is because biochar tends to float on the surface and be washed away readily, and that's where terracing is really critical. Yes, she was mentioning the flooding in particular. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Right. Um, <laughs> yes. Uh, very good talk. Brian von Herzen from the Climate Foundation. I have a comment and a question. I concur with you that the soils are an excellent storage for long-term carbon. I would also like to point out that a third of man's carbon today is already in the oceans, and the ocean actually holds 55 times more carbon than the entire atmosphere. So the middle and deep ocean is an untapped resource for ultimate sequestration of carbon, in addition to the soils, and I think both should be looked at very closely. This, the question I have is regarding uh, this rock powder. Specifically, we know that it has phosphorus, we know that it has potassium, but the question is, what is the bioavailability of that phosphate and potassium uh, under these conditions. I mean, I imagine some of it would be bio bioavailable and some not. And have you looked at this question with different rock powders, for example? Well, yes, thanks, Brian. Um, that's a very good point. Uh, let me just say this. With regard to the ocean, there's no question the ocean is a major player in the global carbon cycle. It's also much harder to manipulate than soils because we can't really control winds and the waves. And that, that's what's, so with the ocean, you've got these enormous flux of CO2 going in and coming out, and we have very limited ability to manipulate them the way we can by growing plants and putting that carbon back into the ground. So, you know, I, I, this is why I see that the efforts do need to focus on land, because we can, I think we get a lot more bang for our buck. In terms of your question, obviously the rate at which these things are released is going to depend on the kinetics of dissolution of the minerals. The more finely ground they are, the better. Now, the fact is, you couldn't really afford to grind rock powder fi fine enough because of the grinding costs. The stuff we're using is free because it's a waste product from the result of gravel production. Of course, once they recognize it has a volume, it will suddenly have a volume, and that, that will change the economics. But as of now, it's basically a waste product. Um, and I think, you know, there's a lot that can be done with it. You know, you know say you're not deliberately grinding it fine, it just comes out by accident. Yeah. Uh, Jeff Wall with the Biochar Company. Um, I might have missed it, but I was curious why you were using untreated, un 
pre-treated biochars for your study? Is that well, something you were trying to gain? No, it's just what we had available. The, 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 the truth is mature stuff started. would have been a lot better. And we're not using. We wanted to see how long it would come to take it come into effect. True, this people need to be doing this with a lot of materials and different things and combinations all over the place. We once we try to do too many factors, it blows out of control and becomes impossible to manipulate. But I mean, this is only one example. But we want to see people doing this every place. Yeah, sorry. That was basically my question. I was wondering why there wasn't the decision to. Uh not inoculate the char with something like compost teas or something like that, that would be well, relatively that low cost. Possibly. It would have made a lot of sense. We didn't have it available in the time frame okay. that we were doing it. Um, I mean, now we know people who have much, you know, <laughs> have more mature stuff. Uh, sorry, uh, Ron? And yeah, we'll have I have one or two more questions. Okay. I, I happen to know that Tom is one of the world's experts on coral. Would you talk a little bit, answering Brian, about both ocean acidification or ocean temperature rise? As, as an important reason to do something in carbon dioxide removal? Well, yes. I mean, let me, let me just say this, is that, that I mean, as, as you and Brian both know, I'm also a marine biologist, and I, I do a lot of work on coral reefs, which my work has shown is the most temperature sensitive of all ecosystems. We're already at the temperature threshold, at which we've lost most of the corals in the world. We can't take any further warming. And so every time I hear governments say, oh, well, let's go for 450 ppm with 350 ppm, the last time CO2 was 280 ppm, sea level was 8 meters higher than today, and there were hippopotamuses and crocodiles in London, England. Okay, people don't realize how sensitive climate is because we haven't yet felt the effects of the existing excess CO2 in the atmosphere. We need to remove that excess very, very quickly. And that, to me, the only hope we have is large-scale biochar application worldwide and systematic policies to solve the problem. The politicians are not there yet. They're in denial. They're in denial about the effects. They don't understand how crucial it is. But we really need to act fast. There's very little time left. Okay, last question. Uh, <laughs> How's your ego? <laughs> Sorry? Something you left out of everything you said, which I think is very, very critical. You didn't talk about the microorganisms and what they're doing in the soil and how they interact with the charcoal and with the rock powders and make them bioavailable. That's, you've got to bring that into the discussion here. Absolutely. Uh, thanks for raising that. I mean, obviously, obviously the, the minerals and the um, biochar is, is the framework on which beneficial microorganisms, in particular mycorrhizae, are translocating the added nutrients that are put into the biochar directly to the plant roots without passing through the mineral soil. And it's really crucial to do that. I mean, when, when we add chemical fertilizers, we, we cut those natural cycles dead. And David, David, I, I know we'll talk more about this. So yeah. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. We have one very last question. Okay. He's been <laughs> yeah. waiting He's, for uh, Yes. The seaweed, uh, seaweed Sorry? Seaweed. What is mixing seaweed with the seaweed, seaweed. Ah, seaweed. Feed, feed stuff for the Yes. Yes, well, the thing is, we didn't have that available here. I used to collect seaweed for my own garden. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, seaweed, seaweed, um, and in fact, sea salt essentially contain all of the minerals plants need because in the ocean, only nitrogen and phosphorus are really limiting, iron to a very limited degree. And so the sea salts contain every other element except nitrogen and phosphorus in excess. And so they're very volatile compounds. You have to wash out the salts, too, because the high sodium chlorine can, can affect your plants. Once you have that, it's great. The problem is it's very lightweight and bulky, so it's not worth economically transporting very far from the ocean. So if you live near the sea, it's worth it. If you live far inland, it may not be worth, worth the transport costs. All right. Yeah, thanks. Thank you. <laughs>